Hello, everyone. This is Alan. Before the episode starts, I wanted to let you know that Francis edited the episode and made a special binaural version of the episode for you to listen to. So this will be just the regular kind of audio file that you would get any other time that you listen to the show. But if you check the show notes, one of the links will take you to a page where you can listen to a special version of this same conversation that sounds as if you're sitting at a table with the rest of us all around you. It's a little bit of extra effort that came out really, really well. I really loved listening to it as I made the show notes for this episode. I think if you have the chance to listen to it with a good set of headphones or in a situation where you have good surround sound, you're really going to enjoy the conversation. So just head to the show notes and check that out if you have the opportunity. Thanks. Welcome to Measures of Truth, a His Dark Materials podcast. I'm Caitlin. I'm Alan. I'm Francis. And I'm Anya. And today we're discussing chapters 11 through 14 of The Amber Spyglass, the third book in the His Dark Materials trilogy. Chapter 11, The Dragonflies, Will and Yorick meet Ama, everyone's favorite, and make a plan to rescue Lyra from Mrs. Coulter. Will goes into the cave to memorize the layout and meets Mrs. Coulter. She captivates Will. I I wouldn't use that word, but okay. And offers an alliance with him. Yeah, who wrote this? (laughs) Will leaves the cave confused and unsure. As he decides what to do, the Zeppelins of the Magisterium can be heard approaching. On board the Zeppelins, the Galavespians watch new dragonflies hatch as they report their location to Lord Asriel. In Chapter 12, The Break, as the Magisterium Zeppelins, Asriel's Gyraptors, and Will and Company all prepare to enter the cave, Lyra sleeps on and Mrs. Coulter waits. Will creates a window into another world that allows Ama and him to pop out near Lyra in the cave. But the golden monkey sees them. Mrs. Coulter moves to confront them, and Will prepares to cut another window for an escape. However, when Will sees Mrs. Coulter in the moonlight, he thinks of his own mother, loses his control of the knife, and it shatters into a million pieces. Or, like, seven pieces. (laughs) Somewhere. Somewhere in between seven and one million pieces. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Ama manages to wake Lyra with her medicine as the Magisterium and Lord Azrael's forces battle outside. Mrs. Coulter aims a gun at Will, but the Galavespians attack her and allow them all to escape. In Chapter 13, Tialis and Salmachia. In the confusion, Will and Lyra escape through the window in the cave. In the other world, Will catches Lyra up and she consults the alethiometer about what to do next. Wait. They need they, to go to the world of the dead. They don't escape through the window in the cave. They escape through the other window that's like in the jungle. Do they? Yeah. In remember. the confusion, we all got so confused that we <laughs> wrote yeah. the wrong window down on the script. Because the they, they, <laughs> he, closes, he c- closes the cave window after they go oh, through it. Because it's the, oh, the yeah, moon is right. too bright. Um, and we're keeping all this in. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good. <laughs> they do, in fact, escape through the window in the jungle. I don't even think it's the jungle; it's a mountain. Uh, it was like hidden behind a bush or something. In the the bush. The other window. window? I don't know. They yeah. escape through the, pre- the window, the window that was previously cut <laughs> through the undefined window. 
Yeah, it's like <laughs> mountains to jungle, I think. They need to go to the world of the dead. <laughs> I'm trying, guys. <laughs> Good. <laughs> they need to go to the world of the dead and find Roger. <laughs> so <laughs> <we're with a laughs> <laughs> we yeah. are really together, folks. They need to go to the world of the dead and find Roger. But they will need to repair the knife first. They make an uneasy alliance with the Galavespian spies and decide to ask Yorick to repair the knife. In chapter 14, know what it is. After resting, the Galavespians inform Will and Lyra that Asriel's forces captured Mrs. Coulter. They explain that they know this thanks to their lodestone resonator, which operates on quantum entanglement. After a long hike, Lyra reunites with Yorick and mourns Lee Scoresby, who we all remember is dead. And got it. Yeah. He did in fact they, die. Spoilers. Yeah. And got eaten. They all, most importantly, mm -hmm. by, yes, by, by Yorick his mates. himself. They all go to York's cave and Will explains that they need York to repair the knife. York does not trust the knife and feels that they do not understand enough to safely use it. Lyra consults the alethiometer, which agrees that it is powerful and dangerous, but it will be needed. And York agrees to repair the knife. How very magnanimous of him. I mean, I like that he's taking his responsibilities seriously. Not many adults in these books do. Mm -hmm. Very true. That is very true indeed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so general feelings. We're done with Ama. Thank fucking Christ. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about that. That like, in like in theory, like the reason why. I mean, like there is no reason why we kept her around this whole time. Like Pullman makes her kind of stubborn and feel like she has to be the one to wake up Lyra, but that didn't need to happen. Like he's 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 kind of like retroactively justifying her being there. Yeah. But he could have just had her give the powder to Will. You don't even need the powder. Like I understand that he thought to himself, well, she's keeping or like Mrs. Coulter is keeping Lyra in a drugged sleep. So we'll need some way to wake her from a drugged sleep. But you can just not write that. You can say she's in a drugged sleep and Will kicked her, you know, like, or whatever, because she was still really groggy. So you could just say, oh, she was coming out of it. Like, it, it was a problem that he created for himself and then felt that he needed a thing to solve it. But it didn't need to happen that way at all. It could have just yeah. edited it way down and not wasted so much time on this random character that means nothing. <laughs> I expect the show to do that. Probably. Yeah, so do I. Uh, I do think that all of this does help to retain the like power of Mrs. Coulter as a villain. Like it, it retains her potency that will can't just come in there and like, boom, got her gone. You know what I mean? Like it, it's hard. Right. But like everything would have played out exactly the same if Alma had not been there. Yeah. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. I think, like, I we, think we, just get, we get Mrs. Coulter being the, uh, sort of charismatic villain that she is through Will. Mm -hmm. we, we get that very clearly through him here. Yeah, like, I I feel like this really kicks off the beginning of the story in a lot of ways. I really hadn't noticed when I read through the book a couple of times how much this is all, like, set up to the first act, basically, until Caitlin has been pointing this out. But I think that's right. I think now we're, like, going. Um, I like all of the characters reuniting. So like the moment that Will and Lyra have together, that Yorick and Lyra have together is really nice. And I like that the Galavespians join the party and there's like, you know, a back and forth about that between them. So yeah, lots of setup that's uh, all paid off in these chapters, I think. And it sets Will's struggle up for the book really nicely, I think. I agree with all that. It, I loved all the reuniting Reun reunions there we go yeah that's a word <laughs> for that and um i wrote it down later but the dynamic between will and lyra versus the galavespians is one of my favorites in the book and how it mm, changes throughout the book uh, it's great mm. yeah i definitely found these chapters to be like nicely paced it never felt like it was rushing too hard or like lingering too much which is always nice because there have been a few chapters in the past which definitely felt like that one way or the other 
Um, I, and I really, really liked just that you had moments of very intense action and moments of relative calm. Like, yeah. both of those together? Really nice. It's almost like that's good storytelling. I did like, <laughs> in particular, the confrontation inside the cage is significantly more t- intense than the big old battle going on outside the cage. Cage? Cave. <laughs> yes. Uh, that's that's something point. that I have talked about before that i love that these books do that like somewhere else there's always a big apocalyptic battle happening but that's not what's important in this yeah. story yeah. yeah exactly that yeah i agree with pretty much everything you guys said i think these chapters did a good job of kind of like competently moving the plot forward um getting us where we need to go for the most part i feel like i don't really notice pullman's prose most of the time i feel like the prose kind of takes a backseat to the storytelling, which is good, I think, um, in a lot of ways. But there were some places, especially in chapter 12, that actually like really stood out to me as good prose, where I was kind of like, oh, I think I think maybe he was like trying a little bit harder here or, you know, like went through a couple more revisions <laughs> um, on that section where it was like the actual words that he was using really stood out to me. What part is that? Oh, that's where like it breaks the knife. I couldn't remember what happened in chapter 12. No, I guess. So like the part where he he talks about Lyra being locked into oblivion. Like mm. that's just like a little bit more uh, like figurative language than I think he usually uses. Um, and then (laughs) I can't, uh, I was talking with Francis about this a little bit earlier. I can't tell if I actually love this or hate this, but, um, he uses the word lyratic as a adjective. Like he turns his own character into (laughs) an adjective. That's so good. Lyratic resolution. (laughs) (laughs) Um, yeah. And it has that like alliteration, yeah, so uh, little whimpers of pity and rage and lyratic resolution shook her breast and her throat. I think that works for a character like Lyra, mm-hmm. who who has been such a such a stubborn little annoying brat. Sometimes, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I say that with affection. <laughs> <laughs> and even like the paragraph above that, where it talks about um, like the golden monkey prowled about by Mrs. Coulter's sleeping bag, scratching with a little horny finger at the occasional glow flies that settled in the cave and smearing their luminescence over the rock. I don't mm. know. It's something about that just like struck me more than it usually does. The monkey in these chapters is fabulous because Mrs. Yeah. Coulter is all, mm-hmm. I love my daughter. I just want to protect my daughter. Meanwhile, her soul is literally just destroying things <laughs> and wants to kill someone and is just... <laughs> <laughs> it's so good i do love the monkey in general i think he's such a good character <laughs> yeah what is everybody's favorite part i'll go first seeing as i can <laughs> 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 i really enjoy the scene where the knife breaks mm-hmm. like there's a certain je ne sais quoi about giving a character some big important plot thing and then, you know, does everything, fixes everything, and then taking that the fuck away. It's satisfying. It's like, ah, you thought you were, you thought you were invincible. Well, here's a new challenge. Fuck you. It's great. And it gives the whole using of the knife, like, um, like it makes it harder. Because even, I mean, a a small spoiler, even after they fix it, Will knows, you know, if he thinks about it wrong, he can break it again. Right. And yeah. when you're trying not to do something, that's when it's going to happen, you know? Like when yep. you're trying not to think about something, it's difficult. It not just think gives about the whole it. thing a bit of an edge. Yeah. If you, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> it also really sets up the, the like warning that. Yorick gives about the knife having its having its own intentions and yeah. and like being super dangerous. I feel like it would be it just like adds some some gravitas to the decision to use the knife. Um and I think it really foreshadows some of the stuff that we find out about the knife later on in the book um in a really uh like powerful and interesting way. Mm. Yeah. It's a great choice. 
for the beginning of the first act, like shatters his, literally shatters his uh, identity Mm -hmm. on a certain level. Yeah, kind of his point in the story. Yeah. Up till now. Um, My favorite bit, I have two, is, uh, as I mentioned, the dynamic between Will and Lyra and Tialis and Salmachia. I just love how both parties think that they're in the right and the other one has to listen to them. (laughs) (laughs) And it's just nice to have some conflict, I guess, like not not misunderstandings or good people and bad people, just like people who have different goals, even though they're both sets of good people. And like ostensibly on the same side. To a degree, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. The stakes are different there. I really, yeah, I really like that moment where Will is like, I will not be talked to that way, first off. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But, and that's so perfect for them because they would have said like the same thing, like you must respect us. And he's like, well, you fucking must respect us. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Um, Must I? Must I though? (laughs) And then I also really just love the whole conversation about going to the world of the dead in a story that is at its core about growing up. It's such a childish thing for Lyra to be like, I have to go apologize to him. Like, that's more important than anything else. Mm. You know, all these big things. And in a way, it turns out that it is more important than anything else. Mm -hmm. And how and then Will is just like, actually, yeah, I didn't really get to talk to my dad. So that would be cool. Let's (laughs) let's go to the world of the dead. Um, And then they have that interesting conversation about how, you know, they don't even really know what part of them goes there. Right. How there there must be like this third part of them besides their body and their demon. And it's and they have the conversation in such a simple way, but it is such a complex idea. And I I just thought that whole conversation was just really good writing and a good character moment. And yeah, I like it. Yeah, I almost picked that moment because I really like in storytelling terms how it kind of turns around some of what was going on with Lyra in the previous book where she was so kind of broken and lost in who am I? What should I do? I guess I'll just do, I'll just help Will out because everything that I try to do messes up, right? Like I just keep messing up. And then she comes out of this coma and she's like, we should go do this. And Will's like, I will absolutely support you in this. It makes their friendship so solid to me. Like as an act, Will is just like, absolutely. I support you. And Lyra is like, I have made a choice. And just the, both of those things together have kind of like turned around the second book in a satisfying way. I also like how it really solidifies like the feel of the book, because book one was very much Lyra's book and book two was very much Will's book. And just in this one conversation, you get that they're both on the same page and equals and wanting the same thing. And exactly, so it, it makes a good dynamic it sets up a good dynamic for the book like francis said it's like good writing or something <laughs> uh crazy idea that one <laughs> i i really liked will's confusion over mrs coulter i think this is really crunchy stuff even though i didn't like it in the previous book where he's like can hear mrs coulter talking to lord boreal and he's like she sounds hot i didn't like that um but I like this mixture of disgust and obsession that he feels with her. It feels more real to me. And like Mm -hmm. just how confused and mixed up he feels just meeting her is just really good. I think it's just like the perfect choice. Um, And Will is starting to admit to himself that he needs uh, more than to be a caretaker to his mother. And that is like so confusing to him. But I love that he realizes that. A mixture of disgust and obsession is what we all feel for Mrs. Coulter. <laughs> totally that is serious. so true. Totally. <laughs> That's the title of this episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Alan, I agree with that. I I wish it was like a little bit more clearly not sexual. Because mm-hmm. that, yeah, I think. And part of that is maybe I'm just reading into the interactions from this book. What I didn't like about the previous book I think it's pretty sexual and and <laughs> like her golden legs in the moonlight and all this stuff is like, what? okay, okay. It's not something we usually get from Will. I guess. Yeah. I don't know. I do think it's interesting that she's like putting on this sexual charm for a literal child, I guess. Mm-hmm. 
I do think in a way it's all Mrs. Coulter knows. Like, yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to excuse Philip Pullman from very much embracing the male case here. Yeah. Cause he does. <laughs> but I, I do think you could excuse it by saying like it, that's how Mrs. Coulter gets her power. That's how she knows how to manipulate people. That's her thing. So in a way it kind of makes sense from her point of view, but the fact that Will gives into it so easily is kind of shitty. I really like what I kind of see as the ambiguity of Mrs. Coulter's motivations here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think you point out that there's definitely the contrast between what we're getting from her and what we're getting from the golden monkey. Um, but I do think, right, that the most convincing lies are grounded in the truth. And I think it is kind of deliciously ambiguous, like how much she actually cares for Lyra and is motivated by wanting to save Lyra versus whatever else she has going on um, in her, you know, scheming and planning. Mm -hmm. I think Mrs. Coulter is the perfect example of somebody who really did not want kids having kids, mm -hmm. you know, because she loves Lyra <laughs> and she wants to protect Lyra, but she has no fucking idea how to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Although, so that's also kind of a good transition into my least favorite part, which was mm -hmm. Mrs. Coulter's hysterical screaming as Will and Lyra leave the cave. It just seemed like really over the top to the end where I was like, okay, now I don't even like, I am the most gullible reader ever. I will what? absolutely fall for every unreliable narrator and character. And even I was like, okay, you're trying a little too hard. Mrs. Coulter, like calm down. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely think she was trying too hard then because as much as she did want to protect Lara, I do think she was beginning to understand that she could not. I see. But she could, like, she wanted Will to take Lyra away, but she wanted to go with them. I mm -hmm. see. Because then she would be safe from everyone, too, because Will has the ultimate knife power. That's fair. Yeah, she didn't... Does that beat the ultimate gun power, though? <laughs> <laughs> I've well, got the can... subtle gun. <laughs> the obvious gun. <laughs> the obvious gun. The obvious gun. <laughs> Um, I also did not like being reminded about how Will's dad died because least favorite part of book two and yeah. and a more substantive point. I ugh, I have feelings about Will deciding not to tell Lyra that her mom was drugging her. Yeah, yeah. that's so interesting. I love Will and Lyra together as like companions and friends and partners so much and i just i feel like that was it just hurts me you know that like he is essentially lying to her by omission mm -hmm. it's one of those things though that like i on absolutely think it was a wrong decision for him not to tell her but i also think it was absolutely something he would do mm. Mm. you know like make a wrong decision there because mm -hmm. nobody wants to be the one to say, like, oh, actually, your mom really doesn't care. Like, she was fucking you over. Can you imagine him telling her that? That would suck. And it would have been the right thing to do. Absolutely. But I can also understand where he was like, maybe she just deserves just this little bit of happiness. Yeah, I I think this is like so weird to me. Like, it really stuck out to me that moment because the story you know, so far and, and like really in this book so much is like ignorance versus knowledge. And there's this thing of like Lyra literally being like, I'm ignorant of this and Will recognizes it and could give her knowledge and truth. And and the I feel like the book situates it as a good thing that he doesn't ruin her vision of Mrs. Coulter in this moment. So like I'm confused by that, like the moral message that is happening from the book there. It feels like the book wants us to take this as a good choice on his part. I agree that it's an authentic choice. Like you said, Caitlin, mm -hmm. it feels like will. And I could see how he even thinks it's the right thing to do, given like his feelings about his mother in that moment and how confused he is and, and all of the pain and stuff. Uh, and, you know, and he just has Lyra back and doesn't want to upset her again, like you said, but the book, it's not like the book questions that at all and i just think it's really interesting i don't know 
it seems out of step with its themes. Yeah, I, I agree. It, the book does um, write it like it's like Will did a good thing for her there when no, he did an easy thing for himself. Yeah. Well, and for her, he, he took the easy way out, which is understandable, especially since he's 12. Yeah. Or 13, maybe. But it's still shitty. Do we all agree that it's shitty? It's shitty. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, I think it's shitty on two levels, right? First of all, he is the person who, at this point, she probably trusts most in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, so, like, it's kind of shitty on that level, but also, it's not unreasonable to think that she's gonna like they're gonna be dealing with Mrs. Coulter in the future, and so yeah. li- that's like important information for Lyra to have in terms of how she interacts with Mrs. Coulter and like the strategic decisions that she makes in the future. That's a good point. So I think it's like, you know, he's trying to save her grief in the short term but it's actually pretty dangerous in the long term at least potentially mm-hmm. yeah. yes i agree with that completely uh, my least favorite part is ama why in the hell was she involved in the rescue? <laughs> <laughs> like what the hell but also just like in general how long it took for the book to get lyra out and like that's not really these chapters in particular but just the the normal complaints that I've been having about this first part of the book, which are Your now single over with. least favorite part. We should just copy paste yes. that each time. <laughs> yep, exactly. But it's over with now. <laughs> <laughs> or is it? Mm. Um, my my least favorite part was not really a least favorite. I I quite liked all of this, but I would. I was talking earlier about the contrast between the inside and the the kind of the inside of the cave and the outside. I would have liked to see more of the outside kind of interdispersed because we hear things only from the perspective of inside the cave. And I think it just would have hit a little harder if we'd have been going between a very tense scenario and a very tense but quick scenario. I think it just would have got it across a little better to me. By outside the cave, you mean the presumed battle that was happening. Yeah, the fact that we have to say presumed battle is kind yeah, of my point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and there's even like a good point when they're running to the window behind the bush yeah, yeah, and exactly. they have to like, they there's like a line about having to wait for a moment and it's like, why not tell us what's happening? Yeah, Give, let, let me <laughs> like feel who's... what it's like to be in that moment. Yeah. Mm. I think the show's really good about that you know, like it takes time. Yes. Yeah. In the first season when the there's like the battle between the Zeppelins and the bears and you're like, oh, wow, I, it just didn't hit me how awful this is and how scary it is for Lyra and stuff. So yeah. maybe they'll take advantage of that. I really hope so. Yeah. I do. And but I'm also worried that the show might decide, like, unlike the books, that the battles are what's important. Mm-hmm. Yes, that is the other side of it. I think yeah. that. I'm not asking for a full Game of Thrones treatment to it. Yeah. But I also would like it. I think they could do it in a way that felt not epic, but intense. I think epic would not give it, not do it justice. That's good. Yeah, Yeah. no, I have a, like in this particular moment, and I think in one that happens later in the book, which is kind of the same thing of Will and Lyra just running through a battle. There's a moment, I hate to make this comparison, and I'm sorry for bringing this up, but in the final Harry Potter movie, oof, uh, where the three of them are just running through the battle that's happening, and it does a good <laughs> job of showing you that there's a bunch of shit happening. So something like yes. that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do agree. Mm-hmm. Actually, my apologies. Really good. Fuck turfs. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I, yes. Fuck turfs. But <laughs> I did see that movie long before I realized Yes, the Anyways, for any I'm of us sorry. realized. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh yeah, so my least favorite thing is um actually my favorite thing, which is disagreeing with Anya about <laughs> Mrs. Coulter's uh ambiguous motivations. Uh I I felt here the I I just feel like the writing craft of this. So I'll here's my caveat to this. I think this is good writing. There's nothing wrong with it. It's kind of like what I think of as like C plus writing, Uh, you know, like a a B would be better and a plus would be the best. So 
when you're writing a story, you want to have like your protagonists making choices and then your antagonist is blocking their goal. And that's like the bare minimum an antagonist needs to do is to block the goal. And they don't need to be necessarily like very well motivated to do that. They just need to block the goal. Like you don't need to understand why. It's nice if you understand why. I think it makes a better villain if you understand and they have like fleshed out psychological motivations and stuff. But I feel like Mrs. Coulter is becoming more and more erratic, which again is fine in the story. Like it doesn't, it's doing the thing that it needs to do and the focus is on Will and Lyra. But we could have a richer, more A plus, if you like, story if Mrs. Coulter was more psychologically fleshed out. Like why is she keeping Lyra safe all of a sudden? Where is all of this coming from? We just don't get much insight from her. And again, I think that's the right, choice overall and it would change the story a lot i think the show is exploring this space in a really interesting way like we know a lot more about mrs coulter from in the show than we do in the book and i think it is changing the story on a certain level when you compare the two of them too so like i just felt that c plusness as a villain for mrs coulter she's blocking will's goal she's blocking lyra's goal and she's just you know that's that's punching in and punching out if you're a villain <laughs> in a story. She's just doing her job. Uh, I guess I can. I mean, I I get your complaints, but maybe maybe part of this is that I am projecting uh, Ruth Wilson's magnificence onto the page. <laughs> I totally see her in like through the whole thing. I, it was it was Ruth Wilson in my head. I I don't know. I am. Maybe it is just because I am so gullible that like and I'm uh, even thinking so this is only my second time reading this book that I like really remember it clearly and I do remember I think the first time you know like a couple years ago feeling myself fall for her and being like well maybe she really does care about you know like I yeah I just appreciated feeling like I was unsure of the character and didn't know what she was going to do because she's yeah, kind of like erratic good. all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. I think that works to its favor, right? That yeah. Because you can't quite read her. You're like, well, maybe she really does feel this way or maybe she feels that way, but doesn't know what to do about it. Like, yeah, I think all that's fine. And in a way her like erratic nature of it, it's almost like she's kind of unraveling as a character in a way that feels intentional and like it works for me but i can see how maybe it wouldn't feel that way for you yeah well i yeah just in terms of the i just see the story mechanics a little bit the gears spinning which you know again there's nothing wrong with this it was just it was just okay you know she's not she's not richard the third or iago i mean you know like god god forbid uh he's not at the shakespeare caliber why why not why can't you do that uh, elevate your villains. It's it's fine. It's just my least favorite thing. I don't know. That's interesting because I the de the erratic deconstruction of Mrs. Coulter in this book is one of my favorite things. Mm hmm. I just can't tell where it comes from. I guess. Yeah. It will. We'll have plenty of more chances to talk about this because it continues. And just as I, I think about Mrs. Coulter's character in this book, it's yeah. like wow, she is just like a pinball, just like boom, 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 just all over mm -hmm. the place. I, I do think, like, I don't know where exactly she had her switch, obviously, but I do think it comes from she has genuinely decided that helping Lyra mm, in her own selfish way is more important than everything else that she's dedicated her life to. Yeah. Yeah. And and and, and she doesn't quite know how to do that. <laughs> she doesn't know how to do that at all. I think it's <laughs> yeah. like there's a conflict in that she is... She's making these decisions where I feel like maybe she almost doesn't even know what her motivations are. Like she's mm -hmm. she cares about Lyra, but it's kind of all driven by her ego. It's mm -hmm. I wouldn't say that with how things turn out, though. With maybe. Her. I don't, we, yeah, we can we can talk about it as it goes forward. That's true. We should probably move point. on to yeah. the actual chapters <laughs> that we were supposed to discuss today. <laughs> right. Okay, so problematics. Um, 
Pullman does this thing, right, where he keeps on referring to the African forces, which is a very common thing that a lot of white European slash American authors and creatives do, where I think we talked about this a little bit before in the in previous books where it's like Africa as if it's one single thing and not the large one single mysterious thing. yeah one single mysterious thing and not like the largest continent with the most diverse cultural and linguistic groups of like all of them um to be fair and I'm not going to do this. This is no, not me making any excuses because I'm sure that the reason is, as you said, but we don't know where we don't know whether Africa has the same meaning in the place where these soldiers have come from. It could be one giant unified African Republic, for instance. Africa could be tiny because we know that there are changes in landscape between worlds. So we don't know if, if Africa is actually a tiny little city, for instance. It's it's obviously I like this is definitely post hoc. And <clears throat> like you you can if you look at it, you go, well, no, we all know exactly what he meant. It's kind of like when he went the Egyptians and you're like, ah, I know exactly what you're saying there, Mr. Pullman. Thank you very much. Yeah. But it is like technically it could be not, but it almost certainly kind of is is the issue there no i totally get Mm -hmm. what you're saying and i actually had some of those same thoughts too that because this isn't set in our worlds and it's not i mean in its most problematic form right when authors do this there's like each european country has like its own distinct culture and language and context and everything and then like africa is all kind of grouped together in this world <laughs> yeah. with tribes that are mostly the same, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 But Germans and French people are way different from each other. So different. Yeah. <laughs> could you imagine the European forces? <laughs> well, yeah, right. Exactly. But actually, exactly. in this case, it actually does kind of work that way, right? Because the magisterium forces are like a pan European force. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. But they also mm. refer to the Magisterium forces as the Swedish forces at one point. Or Swiss. Yeah, the, Swi- the, the Swiss. Swiss. The Swiss. The, the, you're that, right, you're right, Swiss. Okay, so that's very specifically referring to the Swiss Guard, which are the guards of the Vatican. Right. So they are a oh, very well-known, okay. very specific detachment of um, the armed forces of Vatican City. And the Swiss okay, used great. to be I was badasses. not aware. <laughs> My point doesn't matter then. Carry on. Well, they wear very does, gaudy clothes. It does. It does, exactly. It's a it's it's still very interesting but i think you're right to point that out is that it's the magisterium until it's the swiss and it's because the swiss Mm. are like like francis is saying they're like the special forces right like this is the navy seals army rangers whatever it's mi6 yes though they are also not swiss necessarily right the the other thing that i think is interesting is that Well, so like I'm putting myself in Philip Pullman shoes, like how would I solve this problem? You know, on the one hand, it is like people from the continent of Africa have advanced technology and are getting involved in a way that is like, I guess, maybe better than it just being all white people. But I guess I get why he didn't want to use like country names from our world because he's trying to make this like very much an alternate world situation. But he also like, he doesn't even know enough about African history and culture to come up with a plausible alternate development, right. In the way that he did with Europe of how like, Mm -hmm. okay, well everything went different with the, the Protestant reformation never happened. And the papacy was in uh, Geneva, right. you know, like all of that. He could have looked up the some like different ethnic group in Africa and, you know, named the forces after that, making it seem like, OK, well, maybe in this world, Africa wasn't ravaged by European colonialism. They kind of developed on their own with their own sort of like ethno states or something, you know, or maybe they had like their own empire situation going. Yeah. Just like 
if he put a little bit of effort put, into yeah, it. Yeah, just like spend yeah. give me 10 minutes of thought about like, <laughs> okay, how what happened in Africa in this alternate world, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Like put put 10% of the effort you put into thinking about this alternate Europe. We'll uh we'll get more about the like African king who is part of the coalition of uh Lord Azrael and stuff like that, which I do think is is good, but it is still problematic in in the way that you say. And I definitely agree with what you're saying about like the history. You could have like there were Salamaic Christians throughout Africa. Like Africa is so often uh characterized as like this you know, quote unquote, godless place that European Christians had to go into when they had a completely different Christian tradition all on their own. There was Coptic Christians, there was Salamaic Christians, and then Islam came through and a lot of North Africa became Islamic. And so it has a very rich Abrahamic tradition right alongside Europe. And in fact, like all the Salamaic uh, Christians thought that Europe was like, Oh man, those weirdos up there who have like, have you ever seen how they put like a bunch of bones in a bunch of uh, a vial of oil and then they like put that on a pedestal and pray to it? What a bunch of fucking weirdos the Europeans are <laughs> because we're like we're Christians too and like we don't do dumb shit like that. So like they thought that Christians were weirdos in Europe once they uh, met up with them in the Crusades and stuff because they were like, oh yeah, we believe in Jesus and we have these gospels. And then they would hear from the Christians, yeah, and that's why our priests hit people only with a mace and never with a bladed weapon. And they're like, what? <laughs> you, what? Wait, what? <laughs> what are you doing? And so, yeah, you can have a completely different relationship with Christianity and explore, like, you know, more of the um, traditional or what, however you want to think about it, ethnic traditions around, you know, their religiosity and ancient gods and how that interacted and maybe why those people hooked up with Azrael, but none of that stuff is explored. So I agree with you. I'd just like to issue a very quick correction to something I said earlier. The recruits to the Swiss guards must in fact be unmarried Swiss Catholic males. Unmarried. So yes, they are in fact Swiss. My apologies. Yeah. You know, the way that Jesus had guards who were armed. I, I totally look, <laughs> I love these books. That's great. But I hate how he puts in like a line like the Swiss guard. Like I had, I've been reading these books since I was 14. I had no idea what that meant. I just, I genuinely thought it was just some random Swiss people. Okay, Kate, <laughs> you need to look at our chat Wait, though and, and it's... look at the, the outfit. I want to hear your live oh, reaction. So yeah. this, <laughs> this is what I imagine the outfit to be in. Oh, and no. I guess we'll put it in the show it's notes. It's 100% yeah, what I thought too <laughs> oh, when I was imagining the book. I was like, oh, that's really funny that he put that in there. The close up of his face. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> The the thing I will I will say is I did imagine when they he was uh, Pullman was describing the crossbow bolt and how it had like um, spiraling That's uh, so weird fins on it essentially what they called yeah. flights and I just imagined those in the Swiss Guard colours as well <laughs> I was like these are the, the most colourful little bastards Good. can you imagine being killed by someone dressed like that like how embarrassing would that be oh listen those guys were badasses. <laughs> Reminding me of the or right of the the spiraling arrows just like really drives home our whole point about the African forces. Like we had a whole paragraph about that arrow. Yeah, that right. Meant fucking nothing, <laughs> mm -hmm. and didn't like it, it. It upped the threat to a battle that we didn't even see. Right. Yes. <laughs> like I think also we we do we do hear more about those forces later, but that is not now is the issue. Yeah. Yeah, but it's not like, you know, Wakanda in Black Panther or something like mm. that, where they're, they have these advanced weapons, but they're idiomatically traditionally African, right? Like, it's kind of like how a lightsaber is like a European sword. They would have like these African shields, right? Again, but they are like even that's force field hugely shields, reductive. You know? Well, like, I, I, yeah, but like, at least it's like idiomatically specific, you know? <laughs> It's, it's kind There's of the just opposite nothing. of idiomatically specific. You know, but there's um, just nothing in the book. It's just like the take African like a forces fall. versus a um, you know, what's what's the name for the one that's a coit? But yeah, like the, the vastly vastly different traditions of weaponry uh, oh, throughout totally, Africa, in yeah. particular, and and also in you know in 
you're talking about your lightsaber thing. Sorry, I was I was watching a huge thing about swords earlier because I'm I'm like that sometimes. Um, but the saber is one sword that was used in Europe. Um, the fundamental idea behind it is a fairly simple one that you can use a, a sword to slash. Maybe it would work better. Like it, it's functionally not the same, but similar to like a scimitar and things like that, which is not, I believe, European. Um, and also, yeah. there's a lot of European weapons like the Zweihander, which is you know not a not a. Actually, I suppose Kylo Ren has something that kind of approximates a long sword. But like, there's there's so much there's so much variation in weaponry. I'd l- I'd love to see them armed with halberds. That would have been really interesting. It, it just it it feels like it feels lazy. Is possibly yeah. my issue. It just doesn't even so wait, say. What I'm they sorry, fight with. we've moved on to calling Star Wars lazy. Oh, it's oh, all lazy. No, no, no. Is that where we are? I, I can't. Oh, because <laughs> we, there's no variation we went of lightsabers. Very quickly from <laughs> no, his dark materials my, to Marvel to Star Wars, and my, I'm just confused where we landed. <laughs> my, my point. My point is ev- everywhere where you where you use these idiomatic themes has a distinct tendency to appear like you don't actually know them if that makes sense to be fair i think for most properties it's that you don't have time and money uh they could have though i mean (laughs) star Star wars are you saying star wars doesn't have enough money or game of thrones (laughs) not when the originals came out when the originals came zero money yeah when the originals came out i'll give you that one but like game of thrones is another one Again, did not have money in season one. Did not have money in season Had one. Plenty of money in season one. We're talking relative to like you know the third John Wick, sure, but like it's still a <laughs> <laughs> like um what's it called Lord of the Rings, the first the first of those. You know it had it had a big budget, admittedly. They also completely yes, that's redes- true. They just got wetter to do it and got wetter to do it properly. <laughs> yes, that's fair. Anyway, Anyways, we are vastly off let's topic. Let's get back at this on point. track. <laughs> Science? Science. <laughs> Question mark? <laughs> Science exclamation mark. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I had questions when I was reading this. I was like, oh, good, there's biologists here. I was like, can you have dragonflies the size of seagulls? Or is that like, does their thorax like fall apart or something when it's that big? I don't know what a thorax is, actually. Okay. The dragonflies Isn't that Dr. Seuss? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. He <laughs> speaks for the trees. That's right. Yeah. yeah. The, only, the only being with a thorax, Dr. Seuss. So, <laughs> so the the largest insects in our worlds happened during the late Carboniferous to the Permian period. So that's like before the dinosaurs. This is like right before the Triassic period, about two hundred and fifty million years ago. Oh, um, wow. and so they were called. I'm gonna probably pronounce this wrong. Meganosoptera. Hmm. Kind of informally known as griffin flies. Um, I want one. <laughs> uh, this sounds interesting. Yeah, and so their wingspans were about, um, at the highest end, 28 inches or 71 centimeters for Francis. Ah. Do you Thank guys you. do inches? I, I don't I know. Can, <laughs> I, I, I can think in inches. Okay. Just not only pounds. Okay. Okay. Uh, you need some stones. Yeah, give me a stone here and there. Okay. Yeah, and so there is a little bit of debate over why they were able to grow so big back then and why there aren't, you know, giant insects of that size now. And so the main theory that was actually first proposed in 1911 is that um, it has to do with the level of oxygen in the atmosphere. Um, So back then, um, the oxygen level was much higher than the current level of about 20 percent. So basically, like the way that the insects breathe and do their gas exchange, um, they don't quite have like lungs the same way we do. Um, So the oxygen is more just like kind of diffusing through their tissues and so, like, the bigger body size you are, the, like, much thicker tissue that the oxygen has to diffuse through. So they kind of needed higher levels of oxygen or, as the oxygen levels dropped, smaller body size so that it could diffuse through all of their tissues. 
a problem with this theory um, is that there were also quite large dragonflies in a later period, not quite as big, um, only like 45 centimeters when the oxygen level was lower. So that's like a little bit inconsistent. Another theory has to do with the fact that it's basically the lack of vertebrate aerial predators. So like because there weren't birds and bats and pterodactyls, I guess. More conspicuous. Yeah, that like they were um, that basically, you know, they didn't have to worry about any non insect predators. And then there was kind of like a arms race among the bugs to increase mm-hmm. their body size um, in order to prey upon each other. Mm-hmm. Kind of like fish then. Yeah. Yeah. So like uh, I just looked up how big is the wingspan of a seagull and it's anywhere from like two and a half feet to five feet across. So that's way bigger. Than well, what you're so about. it seems like the biggest dragonfly was about the size of the smallest seagull because <laughs> two and a half feet is uh, OK, okay. A slightly still more than 28 inches, but like close. So not impossible. We have like record of it. Yeah. OK. So in their world, there might just be like less birds mm-hmm. yeah. and bats and that, that type of thing. Or, or maybe the Galavespians are doing something along those lines where they... um where they have a symbiotic relationship such that there could be some selected breeding. Yeah, right. exactly. In they fact, they say it. that yeah. there's some selected breeding, I think. That yeah. makes more sense than what I said. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, biology is my career, to be fair. <laughs> yes. Well, also, I was... Yeah, I forgot about the <laughs> symbiotic relationship there. Yeah. It's interesting. So that's not even it's not even impossible. I actually thought that... Like, out of all the things, I was like, oh, this is clearly bullshit. But you're like, no, this happened. So that's cool. Yeah, it's an it, it's an interesting one, particularly, again, I, I wrote down here that the if it was to do with the oxygen levels, then why would the Galavespians be small? There's already so many reasons why a small animal with that body shape doesn't really make that much sense that you're kind of just adding to that. But also, I'm not sure that again pullman really thought about this in that much depth i always mm. just assumed that pullman like read the borers when he was a kid and was like yeah let's throw them in here <laughs> you know, i want some tiny people yeah 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 i'm writing my own fucking book but also because of our lung structure and our circulatory system are we're not really limited by gas exchange in the same way that insects with a more open circulatory system are i mean so they like true. very true they have a heart so it does like fluid <laughs> gets pumped but they don't really have like blood vessels in the same way it's more of like a gentle sloshing i think oh <laughs> the gentle wow. sloshing of a book lung is my new breakout novel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i'm i'm glad to hear that the insects that i sometimes have to murder have a heart yes <laughs> Quantum entanglement. Quantum entanglement. Yeah. What was your question? Is that correct? Is that this is like exactly how quantum entanglement works, right? You play like a violin. Yep. And (laughs) on a magnet. On a magnet. Mm -hmm. And then a magnet somewhere else with a violin like spits out that sound, right? Yeah, pretty much exactly that. That's how quantum computers work now is it's uh, it's actually just (laughs) a bunch of violins. The world's smallest violin, you might say. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. No, um. Yeah, not really. I'm not. I'm not a physicist, and I am not. I don't really work on com- on quantum uh, stuff with computing either. But I get interested in in information theory and things like that. So this is actually quite an interesting question to look at. Basically, no. Short answer: No, this won't work. Um, oh, okay. Specifically, well, uh, the current thinking is: if you have two entangled particles, they are in a well at least one of them is in a state of quantum superposition now basically their state is still random and indeterminate so this is like the cat could be dead or not dead in the box yes exactly and whilst 
you can observe the state of one of them and the state of the other one. And there are some clever ways to force it to be in a certain state. You don't know if that will have necessarily happened to the other entangled particle, because that's mm -hmm. still in a state of superposition. You may have locked one of them to be in a state of one, essentially, but the other one, you don't know. The only way to find that out is to send your, your data to the other person but how are you going to do that? You know, we're, we're, we're trying to communicate faster than light here. And uh, we, 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 we can't do that because we need to exchange information in order to check that the faster than the light thing actually happened the way we thought it did. So you right. need to, so, you need to uh, well, at least at present, our understanding is that you're always limited to light speed at the max. Okay, let me ask a question to see if I understand. And right. maybe this will help our audience. So... Like what you're saying is I have a particle here in America, you have a particle in Europe, in, in mm -hmm. England. And so then I do something to my particle and I go, Francis, did yours change? And by the time I've said that to you, it's too late to know if it changed at the same moment mine did, right? So not, not quite, but almost. Firstly, there's, a, there's, there's, there's some subtleties here because you usually will need to know if you changed the state of the particle on your direct on your side so you're looking for a way to measure it that also fixes it into a particular state but like playing the a issue, violin on it yes exactly <laughs> but, uh, something like that but the issue really comes with the fact that that the information that was carried there, there was no information actually carried over to me we don't have any information until you send me that message saying hey did it change Mm -hmm. In which case, if you've already got a way to talk to me, why the hell are you playing around with a violin? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> like, you need another way to communicate. So, you know, this wouldn't be useful without another way to communicate. So what's the point? Right. <laughs> Basically, yeah, you, um, the current thinking is no matter how you try and do it, there's no way that you can... You, you, can't, you can't even do things like measure the chance that it would be either... Basically, you, there's a, a way that you could think of doing it, which is working out the probability that your particle on one end is either definitely a one, so always, whenever you sample it, it always comes out as a one, or it comes out as a zero or one, as a 50-50 ratio. And then you're saying, oh, well, you know, we can see by the balance of probability that it sh you, we're only getting ones because it's fixed at one. But you can't even do that because you can't get repeated measurements of the same thing that happens. Each time you measure it, it's functionally a different quantum thing. Right. So there's no way to know. <laughs> so yes, long story short, you, have, you would have no idea that a message was sent or that there would have been per se a message at all. There are loads of other problems. And basically, it's a nice rock in a nice case with a bow. But that's, yeah, that's about <laughs> it, I'm afraid. <laughs> I feel like this is the most quintessential like quantum bullshit ever. Like yes. we know that this works, but we don't really know that it works. <laughs> it's very it's actually very um <laughs> indicative yeah. of the time in which this was written. Right. Yeah. Because bear yeah. in mind this was written what, nineties? Uh this uh, came out in two thousand, I think, or two thousand one. Yeah. So, so yeah, it was written, written in, in written the nineties. Yeah. yeah. Maybe early two thousands, but yeah, like and to be fair to Pullman, this is all over science fiction and fantasy oh, that comes yes. out around this time, too. Like everybody yes. was like turned on by this idea. And it's the yeah. same thing as like, you know, we talked about Marvel earlier, you know, like Stan Lee hears about like gamma radiation and he's like, that would turn you into a monster, right? And like, yeah, sure. That <laughs> yeah. works. Like, that, that's science, well, right? Ta yeah. yeah. <laughs> just to, I just looked at the publication information. It was indeed 2000. Ah, yeah. perfect. Yeah, I don't mind this in my sci-fi. I tend to prefer harder sci-fi. Like, mm -hmm. I like it when authors are considering what sort of munitions you could use on a ship. To mm -hmm. you know, so it's uh, is it Vata's War where they only use crossbows essentially on the ship to make sure that they're not penetrating. They they have other weapons, but they don't use them on the ship because otherwise you could penetrate the skin and everyone dies. Right. So yeah, like I like that sort of thing, but I can deal with a bit of soft sci-fi. I mean, this is full of it. So yeah. in all in all meanings of the phrase. <laughs> Did I could be incredibly wrong here. I seem to remember reading though that the fact that Philip Pullman chose a lodestone made it even less likely that it would work. 
a lodestone, it, it would be very hard. So we usually use, um, we essentially use lasers and we can trap ions. I don't know exactly what ions we use off the top of my head. But yeah, we, we essentially use a bunch of like, it, it sounds super sci-fi. It's, why not just right. use the sci-fi-ness? It sounds super, super, super cool. I don't think we've ever done it with um, like a stone for a start. <laughs> like that's a very complicated bit of mineral. <laughs> yes. From, from what I recall, again, I read this over a decade ago, so don't quote me on this. But like Word that it would have made more sense to choose like any other rock than a magnetized one. I could see mm. it being, I can't see it making it easier. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> adding, adding a big old magnetic field in the middle is not going to make your quantum entanglement easier to work out how it's going. Like, like just, that's, that's, just, that's just such a bad idea for so many reasons. <laughs> <laughs> I think the first time I read this before they say quantum entanglement and they talk about lodestone resonator, I was like, oh, this is like amberic for a radio. Like that's something yes. you could call a radio. And then, and then they're like, right. because quantum entanglement. And I was like, oh, wait, that's not a radio. <laughs> I don't know what this thing is. It should have been a radio. That would have been way, like, especially because at least how, like, crystal radios work, you could have made that, you could have just given that different names and it'd be, like, identifiable as this is a, you know, crystal radio. But the problem is it has to go between worlds. And Universes, so, yeah. yeah, yeah. Radio waves... Did they know that they could do that? Like, oh, this is the, the other thing. Like, the quantum the ga the gal yeah. have the Galavespians been... Like, also, that brings up a whole other question. If quantum entanglement goes between worlds, how does it do it? I mean, you know, admittedly, we have... That sort of, that's also just a general question on how does it work anyway. But, like, yeah. you know, you're really getting into the fundamental physics of how this many-world scenario exists. And the answer is, I guess you know magic i think because they <laughs> the two pieces this is how i understood it anyway because the two pieces are from the same universe they could talk to each other no matter what universe they're in it seems to me like there's kind of a also a thematic uh connection there between like demons and humans you know like the two separate things but one thing that are connected and affect yeah. each other you could even well well, whatever, we can get into the science themes later. But, yeah. I, th I think the overall phrase for this is quantum woo. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. This is a hand wavy, but it's cool hand wavy. Like it's fun and it's a real thing. This is something that I always like in fiction where the fiction like alludes to something that you can go look up. And this is how like I learn most things is because I fall down some rabbit hole. I'm like, wait, that's real. And then you go look it up and you're like, oh, it's it's real in a way that doesn't work for the story. But it's cool that I learned this thing because I never would have known about it at all without the story. This is I, I just I just realized who it reminds me of and what the era reminds me of. And it's the sort of era where Deepak Chopra was particularly doing yeah. <laughs> well, because, again, he was a lot about, well, if we integrate our alternative medicine with quantum physics, suddenly it's more scientific mm -hmm. because i'm a grifter <laughs> <laughs> to be fair though i've never understood why more religiously folks don't use physics to argue that god exists don't give my because you absolutely please. could <laughs> but they never do if they try and do that you do immediately hit the problem that if it if you're using science explanations that implies it can be scientifically explained so it sort of loses that one big protection of well it's not science and can't be understood using science if you're saying well it can then people go well i'm trying to use my science and i'm getting nothing and they go oh uh, not not that science but i mean they do that sort of shit all the time <laughs> i know they do again don't give my ideas not that they'd ever be listening to this jesus right of course <laughs> <laughs> in point in fact jesus yeah <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, last time we talked about Spinoza, and that's kind of what Spinoza does. Yes. Is like it's... all of the natural forces of the universe are like what God is. I was more specifically thinking like how we don't, how things don't happen unless they're observed. Right. On a quantum scale, 
you could scale that up and be like, well, I that's, guess we don't exist unless someone's watching us. That's a tricky one even there, because it's not that it doesn't happen. Per right. Se. I, again, I'm not saying <laughs> that it would make complete sense if they did this, obviously. Yeah. Yes. No, no, no. I'm of course, saying of course. that they could take a base understanding of it and use it. Because I remember when I first learned about that, I was like, wait, what? Like, that makes no fucking sense. <laughs> It does. It's very weird, isn't it? Yeah. I do also just want to pick back up on what Alan said about Spinoza, because Spinoza, I feel, was more redefining what the idea of God entailed, rather yeah. than necessarily using it and saying, this is what God is. He was saying, no, let's redefine God such that this is what it is. Yeah. Oh, totally. Yes. Yeah. Which was he super was saying, cool. <laughs> yeah, he was saying God is not some separate thing or like so even what caitlin says is like i think that's super interesting every time you say that i'm like i'm so intrigued by that idea of like the universe is in some kind of superposition and god is the observer and by mm. observing it kind of tips the universe into one direction or the other yeah spinoza says there is nobody out there there is no outside god is the totality of you know everything put mm. together I mean, I, I don't no remember if we've talked about this before, but honestly, I think that's what these books are saying, too, that God is the totality. Yeah, mm. it, totally. Yeah. And I think that's why <laughs> totally. one of the characters is named Baruch. You know. Yes. Yeah, there's definitely hints there. Also, just, just a, a lovely little extra Deepak Chopra um, A lovely Deepak Chopra. Okay. No one, there's, there's no lovely Deepak Chopra. But he was in 1998. Uh, he was awarded the Ig Nobel Prize in Physics for his unique interpretation of quantum physics as it applies to life, <laughs> liberty, and the pursuit of economic happiness. <laughs> 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 Which is as cutting as you get, really. Yeah, I'm not a fan of that guy. Nah, he's a dickhead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Religion it up. Alan bitch. talks about religion for 40 minutes. Caitlin has an app. <laughs> <laughs> Should I start the timer? Yeah. <laughs> so we uh, we have a lot of cave stuff going on in this one, and we have talked about the allegory of the cave. And what this made me think about was that the allegory of the cave, I don't think we've ever said, comes from Plato's Republic, uh, which is kind of a novel. It's not really like a philosophical text it's not really like uh you know like a philosophical text like this is the terms that i will use and their definitions and this is my idea and this is why i'm right it's like it's more like a play or something it has characters there's lines there's you know stuff like that the setting there's it's a it's a book it's a novel so what i think is interesting about this and people never talk about when it comes to Plato's Republic is that it's a lot like Philip Pullman's books in that it was controversial at the time. It was um, blasphemous, like re religiously blasphemous. It was banned uh, in his own community. Like when I think of Plato, like his reputation and his works, they're like, oh, this is highfalutin smart people stuff, right? And it's like really placid in that way of, of like, well, this doesn't, this is just all, you know, capital T truth and like capital P philosophy. It's not like uh, controversial. But at the time it was because the characters that he uses in the Republic were notorious in the, in the character of Socrates. Plato never appears in his own stuff, by the way. It's always a bunch of other people. So you could think of the Republic, like if you were going to write something like this now would be, I don't know, like something like Boris Johnson and Donald Trump having dinner in the early nineties together and talking about like government and being like, what is the ideal government? And you would, and you would know as a reader now that the setting of that being in the early nineties and who these people are, they're not just talking about government. Like this is going somewhere in history. There's an irony to who is talking about what and what they're saying. If that makes sense. Do you get the vibe of what I mean by that? 
Yeah. Because that's what happened in Athens. Athens was the strongest, m- most culturally powerful and militarily powerful city state in ancient Greece. And in Plato's childhood, it completely was destroyed. And like to the point where the Spartans were like, do we keep Athens or not keep Athens? What do you guys think? Well, should we just should we just fucking annihilate it totally? And they were like, yeah, we'll, we'll let them survive and and just kind of walked off. So wait, so Ath- Athens got destroyed by Sparta? By Sparta. Yeah, there okay. was a war between these two states in between Persian invasions at the time. And so like because Athens was like that they, they were both being very imperialistic and being like, this is our territory. And it just led to a big war. Also, at the same time, there was a pandemic during Plato's childhood and a, like a huge plague. And a lot of people died from that in Athens as well. And this was all seen as like a religious failure by a lot of people. The gods did not protect Athens at, you know, Athena and Poseidon did not do their job of protecting Athenian dominance in the region. But to say that is like blasphemous, right? Um, And these are all things that are in the background of Plato's Republic because the guys who are sitting around debating, well, what would be the perfect ideal government are doing it in Athens 30 years before it collapses. And some of them are the architects of its collapse. Some of them are like the people who end the democracy and start the tyranny that follows afterwards. So they're literally like the Donald Trump's and Boris Johnson's of their time. (laughs) And they're talking to a guy that they will put on trial in Socrates for telling the truth about things and and giving him the death sentence for it. There's also a lot of this stuff that's uh, covered. If you don't mind me plugging another podcast that I'm not in, but I do enjoy listening to. Um, Hardcore History has a multi a three parter on called uh, the King of Kings, I think, and part of what it touches on is the kind of Athenian Spartan conflict and all the geopolitics of the region at the time, which is I love that guy fascinating. Oh yes, it's a truly excellent podcast. Yeah, I played Assassin's Creed, so I'm good. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's right. All this stuff is in Assassin's Creed. Yeah. So what Plato's saying is like. In, in the in the Republic, you know, he, he's got these people, these specific people, this time and place. And he's also like criticizing uh, the religion, you know, uh, which was not OK and uh, and all this stuff. So, like, I just want people to know that book is like way more controversial than you might assume it is because it's been, you know, 3000 years since it happened. So it's cooled off a little bit. Um, but at the time it was red hot. And, um, part of the reason that that happens is because Plato appropriates the, um, religious ideas of his time and place in the same way I think that Pullman does. And he inverts them in the same ways. And so we have with Pullman, we have like an angel who is a part of our, uh, heroes group who during the battle that we see here, he goes and hides and cowers, right? He's emotionally broken and kind of useless as a, as a, you know, a contributor to I mean, the, to the party. He does help them out in the end. Like, sure. I, I not, don't, but, but when you think about, let's not say useless, but when you think about an angel in terms of Christianity, this, he's very much inverted the, archetype of the christian angel right this should be an an invulnerable spiritual warrior who you know humans can't stand up to an angel in terms of like the christian archetype of an angel but that's not who balthamus is at all right he's he's very and i think deliberately so and i think really interesting and uh and like he's a great character i love him but like he has so my point is he's appropriated that archetype of an angel is i'm i might be being unfair to balthamus you're right but (laughs) but he is like inverted that archetype after appropriating it and so plato does that when you get to the idea of hades as a place where do greek people go when they die uh they go to the underworld right 
They mm -hmm. cross the River Styx, and it's, and it's in a cave that they go to, basically, in the ground. And they exist there as these spirits who slowly forget who they are over time and become less self-aware and forget their past. And then eventually the idea is that your spirit would kind of be recycled uh, and, and you would be reborn, but you're so totally blank after being in the cave for so long that you don't retain any of the information from your previous life. And so you just go through this cycle forever. Uh, there's a kind of reincarnation in all of the Mediterranean traditions. And by Plato having the allegory of the cave, what he's saying is something very blasphemous, if you think about it like that, because he's saying that this afterlife that we're going to move into, where we all go underground and we slowly forget things, that's life right now. That's life on earth under the government that we're under and, and under the priesthood that is in charge of things who are telling us what reality is. They're the people who are telling us, no, those shadows on the wall, that's totally real. And who are you? You are this kind of specific person. Uh, and then when you break out from that and you go out into the real world uh, out of the cave, when you wake up the way that Lyra does and get out there into the real world, that is like, you know, the, the the life that we're living here on the surface of the world, right? But he has inverted everything. He's turned life into death and death into life and pissed off all of the priesthood when he, when he does that and publishes this book. Uh, he also says in the book that there is one God instead of like referring, you know, these other gods exist, but but there's only one God and it's a rational God. It's a, it's a God of like, you know, reason and a God of, um, that you can understand. It's a God who, you know, when he's laying out in the Republic, they talk about like, okay, what would be the perfect government? What would that be like? And they say, well, what would the church of the perfect government be like? What would the religion of the perfect government be like? Well, it wouldn't be anything like the religion we have now because Think about the stories of Zeus. He's constantly cheating on his wife. He's constantly having children with all these different animals and people. It's really weird. And then the gods are like constantly coming down and bickering. They're, they're so catty with each other and like backstabby. These are not people that we want our citizens to emulate. So we have to throw out all that religion and we have to build another religion up from the ground up. And it's like, yo, you can't say shit like that. <laughs> like, because you're going to piss off the priesthood and get your book banned, which is exactly what happens to Plato. So I feel like there's a lot of... Uh, stuff in common with the Republic and his dark materials in that way. I really hope Philip Pullman never hears this, <laughs> all this like comparison of his little <laughs> fantasy story to, to Plato. I like to imagine that he's listening to us and going, yeah, they make good points. <laughs> about getting rewrite rid of Ama. Yeah. Yeah. Fucking Ama. <laughs> <laughs> his favorite character. He's just going, single yeah, exactly. tear rolls down his face. It's like, I liked her. <laughs> I think that he would definitely be aware of the connection between the cave and death because while Lyra is in the cave, she's in contact with the world of the dead, right? Yes. And so, but we're also like have talked previously about the cave because of the uh, kind of human made alethiometer, you know, technology from, uh, from why do I want to say Cambridge when I know that that's not right at all? Oxford. Oxford. You know, they named it the cave and all that stuff. So he knows about the allegory of the cave. And I think he's definitely on purpose making a link between they're hiding out in a cave. She's asleep. Mrs. Coulter is deliberately keeping her drugged, which is like the uh, the people who keep the people in the cave chained up who are like the forces of uh, political power and religious power in the cave allegory. And then there's the people from the outside who, um, what I think is really interesting here is that when Plato talks about this, he says somebody would get out of the cave, they would find out the truth, and then they would have a moral choice to make. Either they could stay outside in reality, or they could turn back around and go into the cave, 
not to lock themselves back up again and, you know, try to rejoin the people who believe that shadows are reality, but to try and free those people. And immediately, this is the choice I think that Lyra is making is that we have to go to the world of the dead, not necessarily for the reason that I just gave, but she like sees this, I, like the world of the dead is creepy, right? Like it's not really a place. If I had that same dream, I wouldn't be like, gotta go there. Can't wait to, can't wait to do it. Uh, but <laughs> Lyra, that's Lyra. That's what she feels like she has to do. She has to go there and she has to do it for a moral reason, for a reason that is inside of herself telling her that she did something wrong that she has to make right. And that is the exact scenario that Plato posits in the Republic in terms of the cave, that we have a moral obligation once we know the truth and see reality for what it is to try and educate other people about what reality is. I think that when it comes to Plato, what he thinks reality is and what Pullman thinks reality is, is completely opposite from each other in terms of like, we've talked about this before that Pullman is very like interested in our material bodies and our biological bodies and the worth of that and the reality of it, as opposed to like metaphysical or like spiritual or idealized forms um, and, and things like that. <clears throat> So even though I think these have a relationship with each other, I think they're saying very different things. But it's interesting to me how in saying those different things, they were both pissing off the people in power in their time and place. And I don't think it's a total accident. You think Pullman woke up one morning and was like, I will be the new Plato. No, definitely not. He and like, I will do it by getting <laughs> published for 10 year olds. Yeah. Yeah, they talk a lot in the Republic about... Not that I'm disparaging young people's fiction, obviously. I, fiction. I love it. But anyways, carry on. They talk a lot of, in the Republic about what should we teach children about what is real and what isn't. And I think that what the Republic has to say about it is exactly the opposite of what Pullman would feel or even has written, you know, in terms of like... Because Plato's basically like no fantasy, like children can't understand the difference between reality and fantasy. And therefore it can't be allegorical. It has to be like very laid out. This is moral behavior. Like all of the art in the Republic sounds like the most boring shit you can imagine. Like after school, don't do drug kind of specials, a very special episode where you drink one sip of alcohol and it ruins your life kind of stories. So I don't think Pullman would be into that they both recognize that it's very important what you tell children about and, uh, and the kinds of stories that you're telling them. Like there's a giant uh, man in the sky watching everything you do and judging you. Santa Claus? Be one story. Yeah, that guy. Definitely Santa Claus. Or the man Thank in the moon. Thank you for whoever laughed. I appreciate that. <laughs> I think that was me. <laughs> you're my favorite, aren't you? Yay. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that's really important in Plato's Republic is, uh, besides the cave allegory, is that he lays out what he believes is the nature of human beings, which he calls the, well, he doesn't call it this, but he, we call it the tripartite soul, uh, which just means the soul that has three parts to it or three organs. And so he makes this analogy where he's like, it's kind of like um, if you if you were like, OK, we want to make a business, we want to make the most money. Let's look at what business makes the most money right now. Uh, and then we're going to try to figure out, OK, so if they make the most money, then their employees must be the best employees at making money. Right. Because they're the business that makes the most money. And therefore, we should pattern our employees after their employees because that would be the way to make the most money to achieve our goal. They do that, but with justice. So they're like, what would be the most just uh, state, you know, city state that that's like they assume city state is like the only real form of government because they're Greek city state people. Uh, and they say, OK, so if you can come up with the best city state, then you could infer by association that all the people who are 
parts of the city state are the best people, right? Because how could it be the best place if it's not the best people? So if you want to figure out how you become a good person, first you have to figure out what is a good government. And then you just work backwards from that, which uh, is wrong, but yeah. is a way to do it. That Yeah, that makes, <laughs> does not make sense to me at all. I like that. Is wrong, but is, 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 a, way, is a way to do it. Yep. <laughs> Technically um. doable. But unlike well, quantum entanglement communication, which is not. <laughs> it's technically a plan. It's a bad plan, but <laughs> he does he does do that plan. So the the point being, the government has three parts, uh, an upper class, a middle class and a lower class. And he says that this is analogous to what an individual has inside of them, where you have three parts to your being and that is the lowest part being your appetites and this would be kind of associated with your bodily functions i guess and then kind of the middle portion we don't really have a good word for this in english i call it identity um it's, it has to do with like your sense of yourself this is where like shame or pride comes from uh just your self-awareness sort of like who who do you think you are and how does that relate to your place in the world? And then the third and highest, according to Plato, part would be reason, your logical faculties, your philosophical self. And so in Plato's Republic, the ruling class would be philosophers, um, which how great, you know, uh, Plato was a philosopher. I don't know if you knew that. I was going to say, it's so great how he chose, like, the thing that he's known for to be the number one thing. Yeah. If Makes only he was sense. in charge. Yeah. Mm. Of course, nobody ever does this because who the fuck would do this? But um, nobody's ever tried it. Maybe it would work. Uh, it wouldn't. But maybe uh, it would. So the highest class is the philosopher class. The middle class is, like, uh, people who care about being important. Um, and so you give them important jobs to do and they're happy because they're like, I'm really important. Uh, and then the lowest class people are people who care about like good food, having lots of stuff. And so you give them the job of making food and making lots of stuff. And they're like, this is so great. I have lots of stuff. Uh, I'm so glad that I'm still a lower class person. Yeah. In <laughs> like I am currently. And then I would be also you would be in, P Plato's, in Plato's Republic. Republic. Yeah. <laughs> That's uh, wonderful. <laughs> you would have no power. But at the same time, shake my stuff over my dead body. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and in the Republic, the ruling class people have no property. So the only people who have property are the lowest class. So they have some... He, he kind of tries to balance it out. I don't know. Um, I think the, the Republic is, like, super broken. Uh, but... There's arguments that um, that might be on purpose. It's just like a thought experiment to to make arguments. There's there's bold arguments. One of the bold arguments, by the way, in Plato's Republic is that women and men are pretty much equal in all things, which is a pretty crazy fucking idea. Right. <laughs> um, that women would be just as qualified to be the philosopher leaders or the military middle class uh, important diplomat people or the uh, the maker class, the buying class, and and all that stuff, that women could do any of those positions just as well as men, and should be able to. That's a, they spend a whole book talking about that, and all the men are like, whoa, 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 wait, a, wait, what the fuck, what? And Socrates is like, yeah, why not? And they're like, because you're wrong. Uh, but yeah. Okay, but let's say. stop talking about women and go back to the tripartite okay. soul thing. Sure. Um. So is this relating? to the amber spyglass in when Lyra's talking about exactly like so there must be a third part beyond so like the demon disappears the body decays and so there must be a third part but the that goes but the body yeah. is not a part of the soul so in this way it's it's kind of like you have a body and a two-part soul i guess good this is good so I made uh, a, a you, you get moment. a sticker. <laughs> Yay! Yes. Gold, gold star. star. I was paying attention. <laughs> You've pointed out a way that I have confused people, so this is good. Uh, so I made a bad analogy in saying that, like, the appetites are 
uh, have to do with your body because that's not right. Because for Plato, remember, our body would just be a shadow on the wall in the cave, right? Our bodies are not real. Our bodies are an imitation of our soul. Our soul is the only thing that's real. And all of the rest of this stuff is kind of like we live in like a hologram that is like being projected out of the reality of like who you really are fundamentally in an eternal sense, which is your soul. And your soul has these three parts. Your soul hungers for things. It, it can have an appetite for anything. They actually explore this quite a bit where you might have, I mean, we, I guess we would call it fetishes. He talks about like a guy who just likes to go stare at dead bodies and he, he, like he's compulsive about it. It's not food. It's not sex, but those are common things for people to have appetites for, right? It's not, but it's not just that stuff. According to Plato, if you were a really good person, you would cultivate your appetites for solving mathematical equations, for doing abstract philosophy, for like high-minded things. You'd see what I'm saying? For concepts, you would have an appetite for concepts instead of an appetite for these shadowy things that don't really exist. And so your, your appetitive nature is not encased in your body. So for Plato... Only one thing exists, and that's your soul. We don't have three parts. But this is important to understand because it's very influential for people who come later, like the Coptic Christians that I talked about before in the Gnostics. And they interpret it in the way that you're saying, Anya, where, oh, we are made up as a person of three different metaphysical substances. One of them is the body this appetite part. Another one is our soul, which would be like our mind, like our, our, our identity again. And then the last one is the spirit. And that would be the highest one. And that would be the part that it has been cut off from the real God by the evil God of the Jewish people from the old Testament. Right. And so for the Gnostics, they see the tripartite reality of our existence as what Pullman is laying out here. He's using the Gnostic version of Plato's idea as what Lyra is talking about, that she can think about her demon and she can think about her body. Therefore, this indicates that that is a third part of who she is, right? But can't you also think about thinking and then... So th that what you just said is uh, what the Buddha says... And he says, this, this should prove to you because then you can think about yourself thinking about yourself and you can think about yourself thinking about you. Like it's a, it's it a goes infinite on forever. mirror. Yeah. Right. And so he says that should tell you that you don't actually really exist, which is enlightenment. Once you understand that you're not real, then you don't have to ever be reborn again. Uh, but yeah, that's good. You jumped right into enlightenment. So good for you. <laughs> great, great, great. <laughs> So, yeah, that's why I bring this up, because the Gnostics say that the material part of our existence is was made by the evil God in order to trap us. Our soul, our kind of mind part, the demon part in his his dark materials is like the interaction between our spirit and the material physical body that we have. And then the spirit is the eternal part of us that was always really a part of God, part of the uber mind uh, that just has been trapped here by this evil overlord creature. So what I see Pullman doing is like taking the Gnostic idea of uh, what Plato lays out in the Republic and using that as like the world building element in his story, but then giving it a very, very different spin because for the Gnostics, your body is evil. But for Pullman, the body is like the thing that's the best part of being. Well, really, the best part of being alive is when all your parts are together, right? Yeah, I will say uh, uh, Lyra at one point says that the body must be the best. I think it's Lyra. Yeah. But that's just her interpretation. I don't think that's what Pullman is saying. I, but I do think it's them being together. And for the Gnostics, that's yes. that's prison. That's the worst part is for being together. You want to be apart. And I think even for Plato, he's really trying to, like, purify things towards that philosophical end. Right. 
and and downplay your appetites and downplay your ego and worrying about being ashamed or being proud and have everything be in service to being a rational person. Um, Which is kind of what happens when you are severed. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Your appetites and your desires are just there anymore. And you're just kind of. You're good at following directions. Yeah. Yep. Um, Good. So that's the tripartite soul. Mm -hmm. I love that it's this huge, like, philosophical idea that's, you know, evolved, I guess, through the ages. And meanwhile, like Lyra just sat down and in a, and I know that it was obviously written by an adult who's read all this, but it <laughs> felt like a very real conversation when she was just like, well, I've got my demon, I've got my body, but something else must be controlling this all, so, thinking about it all. And that's probably what goes to the world of the dead. It's so elegant. I think it's very powerful the way that he yeah. writes it. It's very elegant. It makes sense immediately. I have a lot of respect for it. And and this is not gone, by the way, this idea. Like, it persists in Christianity, obviously, and you could talk about, like, the Holy Trinity with God, you know, being the soul and uh, Jesus being the body and the Holy Spirit being a spirit, obviously. But even in, like, psychology and, like, the modern idea, we talked about Freud back in book one. Freud takes this exact thing from Plato and reworks it and he says that the three parts of our psyche are the id, the ego, and the superego, which are kind of associated with these appetites in the id. And then the superego is kind of like your ideal version of yourself. So this would be like, you know, that middle part, your identity part. And then the ego is kind of like tug of war or manager between those those two elements, uh, sort of. So this would be like, your rational self, your, you have to like make choices based on these two competing forces inside of you. So you can see that I think really clearly in Will's struggle in the cave where he has all of these confusing feelings brought up by Mrs. Coulter around his mother and it is like, wouldn't your mother do that for you? And how immediately angry he feels about that. But he comes to this revelation about like, that he needed more from his mother, not that it's anybody's fault. I don't think he feels any blame Mm -hmm. about that, but he does realize that that is a real need that he has. And, and then the association that he has later with her and Lyra, but also with his mother in that confusing moment of trying to open the window and the knife shattering is kind of like a Freudian gridlock that's happening in his psyche between these three different parts and it destroys his identity in exactly the kind of like Freudian neurotic freak out (laughs) that we all go to therapy for. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Or some of us just repress. Some of us don't go to therapy. Yeah. Yeah. This podcast is brought to you by better health. (laughs) (laughs) Where they're not Freudian, they do uh, learn how to not therapy. shatter your learn how to rebuild your identity after it shatters. Yeah, <laughs> with resin. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Patch uh, up your holes. <laughs> I'm glad we don't have ads on this show sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so that is like you know the tripartite thing is is alive and strong in our culture to this day. Now, the other part of Plato's Republic that um, is really important, they they come to the A, they do it, they solve it in the book. So spoilers for the Republic, they construct the perfectly just society, which reveals to them the perfectly just person, the perfectly like just is and like the wrong dead. word. That's what um, <laughs> that's what it is always translated as. And it's it's the wrong word. It's like. It should be like actualized or or something like that, you know, like uh, maximized, the, the maximized state, the maximized person. And the answer is, if you guys are ready, I mean, it's 3000 year old answer, but this will solve everything in your Spoilers, life. Spoilers, guys. Come on. Just do your teleological duty. Of uh, course. Of course. Oh. Everything will be perfect. If, we, if you would just They're do fine. your fucking job, just do your job. <laughs> you have one job. Do it and everything would be fine. That's what the career fairs are for. 
That's right. <laughs> <laughs> There's literally career fairs in the Republic where they figure out what your job is going to, your one job is going to be and you never get to change your career track. Are we saying so. that career fairs are in fact an exercise in teleology? Mm-hmm. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> this might have had an influence on capitalism. I don't know. I really hope that Maybe. there's like some teenager, you know, pulling up to the career fair and be like, I'm here to discover my teleo teleological purpose. <laughs> They'll be like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Get out of here. Not a philosopher, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this jumped out at me because Yorick uh, starts talking about the knife has intentions and you're like, is the knife Valdemort? Is this Sauron in his ring? What are you talking about? <laughs> the, this is very confusing to Will and Lyra. They're like, it's a Yorick. It's not alive. It doesn't have intentions, but he's clearly talking about teleology, I think, because um, he gives different examples of things. And it's basically like, what is this thing good for? And if you don't understand what the thing is, then when you use it, it's going to have unintended consequences because it is made to do a certain thing. And if you're not using it, if you try to use your phone as a banana and eat it, then you're going to die. So bananas are bananas and phones are phones and you can't you can talk into a banana. Phone. Yeah. <laughs> well, you could have a banana phone. It would be confusing, though. How, how much of a banana is it? Is it just in form? Is well, it in type? if you oh, quantum banana. entangle a banana oh. with another banana. Oh, we've solved. <laughs> you could have two teleologies. <laughs> and just fit like a trumpet mouthpiece and blow in it. Yeah, perfect. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it won't last long. Fuck your lodestone res work. resonators. We've got the banana phone. <laughs> banana phone. <laughs> Ban banana phone resonator. <laughs> that would have been a much better book, honestly. <laughs> it's a forthcoming His Dark Materials, The Banana Phone. Resonator. I look forward to it. If you're listening, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> Just give us credit on the first page. We yeah, don't need exactly. any money. Or like a hint in some like character artwork somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's, he's like, uh, I think this is all over this part. Like... Will ends up killing some people and he's very upset about it. And I think this... one person, he killed one person. Yeah. He, well, I would be upset if I killed one person. I'm, I know. I... But he said some people. He's oh, killed okay. One dude. You're right. You're right. He killed a person and he's like, I hate this. I hate killing people uh, because he's, you know, it's that tripartite uh, psyche, that Freudian psyche. He has this super ego idea of himself that he is not a killer, but it seems like destiny has this intention for him as the knife wielder to be someone that kills because it keeps happening for him. And the tension between that is like shattering his sense of himself and it's causing him a very uh, bad internal struggle. And so like, you know, can you go against your telos and become something that you're not. It does for Will. This seems to be like his central problem right now, uh, because he tried, you know, in thinking about like who am I and what am I, you know, like the knife exploded. So like his, he can't do his job now in the party, and uh, and it's yeah, that's a big problem. He, he can't do his telos. Um, and I would also say that like Will is currently in a much more mentally traumatic place than Lyra who's just like we should go to the world of the dead yeah and she feels great about it she's very aimed she has like a job yeah yeah and meanwhile Will is like who am I what is my purpose <laughs> I mean we find out kind of a reason for that later but still at least one of them's always on task you know like yeah. they've they've traded she was the lost one before so that's uh that's good couples uh well anyway it's, that's how you want to be a couple one of you be neurotically broken at a given time don't do it at the same time it's not good <laughs> now this is good life advice <laughs> yeah yeah just don't be neurotically broken just do your job just do your teleological job damn it. what if my and teleological job perfect. is to be neurotically broken oh shit you're woody allen i didn't know that you were woody <laughs> oh <Allen. laughs> Oof. Those are fighting words. <laughs> God damn. Claws away, please, Alan. Yeah. 
uh, York makes a really good point here about like ignorance and how that leads to unintended consequences. And it's kind of like a know yourself thing when you think about teleology as like a personal pursuit. Um, and this is going to play into something that we're going to start talking about more, or I'm going to start talking about more, uh, which is um, existentialism. And I've, I've brought that up before. Everyone's favorite. Yeah. And so like it really takes some things from teleology and and runs with them, but it mostly breaks uh, the idea of teleology. And so how it does that is by doing what Yorick says. You have to like look and be honest about what, you know, about the information. You have to like look inside yourself and be very honest and think about consequences to your actions and take responsibility for things. And so he tells them to, you know, he tells Lyra, look at the alethiometer before making a choice. And even after that, I think it's really interesting that the alethiometer is kind of ambivalent. And it's like, yeah, that thing's really dangerous, but is really useful. And that is kind of like the center of existentialism. It's like living life is hard and dangerous and ultimately, like, it, as much happiness as you get out of it, you will get heartbreak and grief and you, you'll just get more of life. It's not a way to maximize your happiness. It's a way to maximize being who you are. And, and that's not necessarily always going to make you happy. So, yeah, teleology, tripartite soul, Plato's Republic. The end. <laughs> That was about 40 minutes, by the way. In fact, maybe a little bit. <laughs> um, I don't know how to transition into this from what we were just talking about. Um, that will use that, what you just said, to do it. <laughs> great, great, great. <laughs> so there was one thing that I wanted to ask you guys, um, which is, what is your take on Lyra's dream? Like, is it a dream that just like coincidentally is real or is she well maybe that's a spoiler um is that some sort of like metaphysical dust scent vision yeah like what are we supposed to think about her dream this is funny <laughs> because th it's a good question and i hadn't done anything but take it on its face value like, kind of like you said earlier where you were like i'm the most gullible reader i'm i'm like the i will just do whatever the story i'm like yeah okay she's talking to roger i guess yeah, yeah. no i'm the same i've never thought about it before <laughs> of whether or not it was just like a, like a guilt-ridden dream that she was having that turned out to inspire her to actually do something or but or if it's real yeah I I come down on the side of real because I do think Lyra gets confirmation from someone later. Mm -hmm. Okay. That it is real. How or why? I don't, there's a bunch in this world that is like something that is true that we never really get knowledge about how it works. Like um, Lyra is part of a prophecy. Where did that prophecy come from? Who gave it? Why do people believe it? Yeah. And, and I mm. think this dream is sort of connected to that. I see. I think in the the intention in the book, again, this might be spoilers territory. I don't know. Um, but it feels like the intention in the book is that you're meant to think it's a dream. Because mm -hmm. it is a dream. Mm -hmm. And at that point in the story, there is nothing to indicate that it wouldn't be anything other than a bit of a trippy, weird bit in the book that kind of doesn't fit with the rest, but you're not really meant to quite clock that it was, in fact, anything else, if, in fact, it was. I see. But then again, he puts so much emphasis, like they have their own sections, almost, that are different than, the, like, they stand out so much. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It's it's not that super you're definitely, <laughs> Yeah, th you're definitely supposed to take it as being real. Or take it as being part of the story. Uh, I guess, yes, that's... I yeah. think there's a similar thing now that I'm thinking about this that happens in the previous book where Lee is trying to get some sleep after they've him and Grumman have crashed, but before they're making their way to where Lyra and Will are. And 
so he's sleeping, but then he has dreams about things that Grumman is doing. Yes. That end up being like real. Like it seems like some part of Lee is able to observe some part of Grumman doing things on like the Zeppelins and other things like that. So there is some precedent in the story for dreams being connected to a real in the world events that are supernatural and, you know, dealing with things other than bodies. It's not like Lee's, you know, like Lee went into Grumman's body and like possessed him or that's not what I'm saying. Like, it's like he's an outside observer to a disembodied Grumman doing magic to, uh, to people on the Zeppelin and stuff. So there's, I mean, it's, it's kind of in the story already. Sort of. Maybe dreams are more real in Lyra's world. I think they will also talk about this exact thing more near the end of the book. Okay. Yeah. That's true. And Lyra also, it's like, she suddenly gains the mystical, basically mystical ability to read the alethiometer and then suddenly loses it as soon as it's no longer necessary. So maybe mm-hmm. it's like the same thing that gives her the power to read the alethiometer because she needs to also gives her the power to communicate with Roger in her sleeping state because she needs to. Maybe. I kind of hate that, though, just because it is all related to the prophecy about her. So then it means that somebody made this prophecy and then somebody is making sure the prophecy happens. Mm hmm. And I mean, like, who is that? Well, I feel like, <laughs> like we never if, find you're, out. if you're going to make a prophecy, you kind of want to ensure it comes true. Otherwise, you look really stupid afterwards when it doesn't. <laughs> I guess I just hate that. That I guess I hate that then that's not explored at all. Yeah, mm. definitely. Yeah, because I just think the alethiometer stuff is like is yeah. like different. It's like a metaphor for something else. I, I don't feel like it's just, well, there was a prophecy and that's why she could do it. I, I feel like it's. I feel like it's something different than that. Yeah, that's I guess that's what it sort of makes me feel like. I I don't know. Um, But also, Lyra was super drugged at the time. And people have, well, throughout history, have always thought that drugs can make us see the truth Mm -hmm. or communicate with beings or whatever. So it could have just been that. Yeah, like if, if you're thinking about that construction of body, soul, and mind that by taking the drugs, you're kind of loosening the connection between your some your body and the rest of you so that you can go off and learn things. Yeah, and like maybe she was so asleep that she was near death mm-hmm. so she could communicate with the dead. Right. That's actually, that's a really good explanation, I think. That was good to bring that up because I don't think there's another opportunity to talk about that. From mm. on. I have a, a weird question. Because when when they're going to collect, I kind of made a joke about this earlier, but when they are going to collect wood for York to build a fire to fix the knife, he specifically says, go get that resinous wood. Mm. Mm-hmm. Is, is that like good for blacksmithery? I, I don't even know what to call it. Like the melting of metal. Does anybody have any idea why? Uh, yeah, resinous wood. Mm. If you think about what now that I'm saying eats. it, yeah, now that I'm saying it out loud, I think your goes into an explanation next chapter. Oh, yeah. So it's possible that, that maybe that explanation may be bullshit, though. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Because realistically, if you're trying to forge nicely, you're going to want things like bellows. Um, yeah. That's kind of why, why bellows particularly were an incredibly useful innovation and helped our smelting and forging significantly forgery or forging or whatever <laughs> it was, very kind, was where well, yeah <laughs> was that's that's where i was trying to go when i said blacksmithery blacksmithery is <laughs> so pretty damn good to be fair <laughs> yeah yeah i don't know anything about that stuff i just that it needs to be really hot so i don't know if resinous wood is better or worse that i seem to think the explanation he gives us is about the smoke or something oh okay or maybe that's just what lyra has to do she has to keep the smoke off of it 
whatever. We'll see next chapter. The only other thing that he could be really saying, he could have intuited that what they were trying to do and thus sent them to a place which was far enough away for yes, that to maybe. work. He was in on them wanting a private conversation. Yeah. Oh, I have a memory of that being what was happening, actually. <laughs> now that you say that, I was like, oh, mm. that's nice of Yorick to give them to see that they needed something and, and be like, go do this thing so that that could happen. Have fun, but, kids. Yeah, maybe I'm wrong. But I think that is it for these chapters. Join us next time. We'll be talking about chapters 15 through 18. If you like our show, please take the time to give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. I'm Anya, and you can follow me on Twitter at Strangely Literal. That's Strangely, then L-I-T-E-R-L. I'm Caitlin, and you can follow me on Twitter at Inferior Caitlin. I'm Francis, and you can follow me on Twitter at Francis Windrum. Follow the show on Twitter at M-O-T Pod. If you need more than 280 characters to speak your mind, send your emails to contact at hollowedgroundmedia.com. And remember to always keep your mind on the job when using exceptionally sharp knives. Francis can get behind. I wrote it. Oh, oh. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yeah, he's mixed up by it for sure. Um, I keep inter- we're all interrupting you, Anya. Say something right. else, and then Francis, you do it. Okay. <laughs> I really like what yeah, I, I agree. <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so I don't think there's anything we need to ask our Brit this week. Um, oh. I don't know. Like, what, what's the weather like in England right now? Uh, honestly, <laughs> it's dark and depressing. You know, the, the thing that you don't notice until you actually think about it is that you're really far north in Britain. And so yes. we start losing, uh, as, as I'm sure Caitlin will know, you kind of start losing all of the, um, what's that word for it? Oh, light. Yeah. And thus, serotonin. <laughs> Brand. I was not expecting a serious answer to my bullshit question. Fuck you. You give me a bullshit question, I'll give you a bullshitly serious answer. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. You know who I would have liked to see in for the Gala Vespians? Mm-hmm. Gary Oldman and like oh. Dame Judy Dench or something. Whoa. I think it would have been absolutely amazing. That's not at all how I picture them, That's but now that you blowing. say that, <laughs> <Yeah>. yes. <laughs> That's really good. Wait, Dame Judy Gen- Dame Judy Dench as Salmachia. Salmachia oh. and Gary Oldman as um, the other one, Tialis. 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 Because they are at the end of their lifespans. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Say it like that, but yeah, pretty much. <laughs> oh my God, that actually, that would be amazing. It'd be a damn good casting. <laughs>